set and ready. So we're going to go ahead and get everything started for today. Uh, I just want to start by saying uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today in the influx room at the Captain Nash Gallery on the campus of the University of Minnesota. Uh, my name is Tyler Lady Fulop, and I am the Executive Director at the Northern Click Center. Uh, as we get ourselves situated, settled in, and ready for today's session, I uh, just wanted to take a moment to uh, pause and respect the acknowledge that the University of Twin Cities campus is built within the homelands of its public people. Uh, it is important to acknowledge the peoples on um, whose land we live, learn, and work uh, as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with our tribal nations. For everybody with us here today, I'd like to take a moment to point out that the discussion is being uh, both recorded and live streamed on the Center's Facebook account. Uh, I mentioned this so that uh, the audience that is connected with us via Zoom, uh, so everyone has that. Knowledge that's being recorded, but also to tell everyone that we uh, really appreciate it. You could uh, turn off your video feed and microphones for able to make the best possible streaming quality. Um, if there is any any internet connection issues that we have uh, during the lecture, it is like I said being recorded. We're going to get everything edited down, cleaned up a little bit, and more that should be posted on the center's YouTube channel for viewing later. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we are gathered to listen and take part in the discussion in conjunction with the exhibition, the gathering works from contemporary Black American Australian artists. Uh, this installation, which originally is a book, co-authored by Chafan Nguyen Dean and Donald J. Clark, uh, was brought to life at Northern Play Center, right across the freeway, uh, so that viewers would be able to experience the work by 36 artists represented in the publication and walk through the pages of the printed book. Uh, if you've not yet had the opportunity to experience the exhibition in person, it is installed through Sunday, October 30th, uh, we are open 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, seven days a week. Uh, but it has already been documented as a free free virtual tour that you can find on the center's website, and that will be posted for at least two years. Uh, we just, as long as we update all of our licenses, we'll be there permanently uh, with all of the, the tours from our past exhibitions as well. Uh, this exhibition and the related events uh, are only possible in part by the Borders of Minnesota through the Minnesota State Arts Board Operating Support Grant. Thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Uh, additional support making all this possible comes from the Wingate Foundation, the RDK Foundation, and the Creek Foundation. Uh, for today's event specifically, I'd like to, like to also take a moment to uh, acknowledge and thank everyone for the generous support uh, in making their, sorry, for their time and efforts to facilitate the use of these spaces. Uh, the Department of African American and African Studies, as well as the Department of Art at the University of Minnesota, Minnesota Twin Cities Campus. Um, and special thanks to Nolan and uh, Rick Zuma, the Captain from the National Gallery, uh, for getting us plugged in and connected. Uh, this afternoon, uh, the discussion the ever present strength, power, and longevity of Black creative labor. Uh, we have four artists from the exhibition gallery who engage, uh, who all engage in play and educational system in different ways. Together, we will discuss creative black labor and its inclusion and disintegration in history, culture, and education. By discussing this history and sharing their own experiences in the field of ceramics and various educational systems, they will offer multi dimensional and expanded worldly perspectives by centering black, African American, and African history, art, and experience. In American culture, education, and contemporary ceramics. As everyone engages in their conversation, we invite you to integrate your stories and envision a more comprehensive and inclusive human story and culture. Uh, following this discussion, we'll be inviting everyone to reflect on their experiences through a very brief uh, hands on making activity in the lobby of the building we are in here. Uh, these pieces that you've created would be acquired at the Clay Center and we'll be able to pick up that NCC in a little bit more than a week. Uh, for the artists that are participating with us here today, we have Professor Bonnie Scroggins, Joanne Kimunis, Keith Wall Smith, and Lydia C. Thompson. Uh, the moderator uh, for today uh, is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of African American and African Studies here at the U, uh, Michiro Inichi. <laughs> Thank you all um, for coming. Hope you can hear me. And thank you for those who are joining us remotely as well. That's what's that's happening, right? Remotely? Great. <laughs> thank you so much. So I'm delighted to partner with uh, Northern Clay Center um, and to introduce um, these artists' work, but their worldliness. Uh, 
and moderate the forum. My name is Yuichiro Michi. I'm Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of African American and African Studies here at the University of Minnesota. I'm also a core faculty member in the Asian American Studies Program. Now, I wanted to also acknowledge um, where we are, but I want to do it a little bit differently and in, in move into the tradition of our department, African American and African Studies. Um, some of us we, who are here at the University of Minnesota to work, to teach, to pursue lifelong learning are becoming ever more cognizant of the specific character of this institution, the higher which was established in 1850 through the seizure of the Dakota people's land, assaults on their people and sovereignty, and ultimately warfare and violent expulsion of Dakota people from their own home. All of this, the University of Minnesota founders achieved within a little over a decade in the name of extending the land grant mission, which meant creating higher education as an incubator of the public good. So long as the mission of the university is couched in a tale of human progress, a narrative of triumphalism, we will continue to deny the history of settler colonial violence and dispossession that gave form to the historically white institution. More damagingly, I should add, we, we will capitulate to what James Baldwin called collective delusion, the act of self evasion that is so endemic to the crisis of the drug. The architecture of domination, the very epistemology of ignorance, to borrow the late Charles Mills, the great rock of race, still remains right here where we are, where we work in it. The Department of African American and African Studies is dedicated to reckoning of historical injustices, to participate in the cause of justice and work of solidarity among the disabled. We will question and resist the status quo in all mechanism of normativity and take the, up the task of building the critical space of conversation, reciprocity, and transformation. We strive to create knowledge that is transformative and paradigmatic. We hope to move in this tradition, the afro black tradition. So we are here to explore the worthiness of, of contemporary Black American Islamic artists, not just their ways of knowing, and being epistemological and ontological authority, but also their ways of inhabiting this world, how they make the world that is wholly anti human, founded upon the denial of the very fact of Black humanity, anew. Their works are now being shown at Northern Play Center, and I have the great sort of pleasure of witnessing and seeing their work. The exhibit is titled A Gathering, uh, curated by Donald A. Clark and Josani Lane D, who is my now colleague here at the University of Minnesota, teaching in the Department of Art. If you have not really declared it, uh, as Kyle mentioned, I really encourage you to do so. Both Donald A. Clark and um, Josani Lane Dean are co editors of this book, uh, just published by Schiffer Craft, um, titled Contemporary Black American Islamic Artists. Available here for purchase as well, so recommend that you grab a copy. Um, our objective is quite simple, um, yet um, demands close attention. And I want to introduce these artists a little bit in depth, but I want to kind of set the context here. Our objective is to dig deep into the world of, of Black creative labor, unpacking its authority, aesthetic, social, cultural, and historical. Political. We will foreground each artist coming into being as a ceramic artist, especially the labor of creating art, how they move from strength to strength in various ways by way of transgressing boundaries of all kinds 
many of which are produced through domination, all in an effort to chart the path for a certain kind of ecumenicalism or universalism that is universalism that is specific to Afro diaspora people of expressive tradition and practice. But to do so demands that we take up the question of how, uh, which is this question is about process and their craft. Um, and that process and craft in and of, its, in and of itself is a matter of resistance, reclamation, reworking, and at times refusal. The overarching question, um, I will introduce the slide, but um, um, overarching question, um, sorry, that guides our contemporary uh, conversations is the following. You know, I wanted to also introduce them so you can see the question that I posed to them prior to this forum. How do contemporary Black ceramic artists relate to the concept of labor in a world where the experience of Black labor in the last 400 years through chattel slavery in the new world and colonialism the world over is marked by theft of bodies, exploitation, voyeurism, fetishization, and commodification. Labor is hardly a neutral category. Given this reality in history, how do you engage in a labor of creating art? What is the wellspring of your creativity or the creative process to reclaim, recall, review, and restore deeply human and sensuous aspects of labor? So such is the guiding question. But if, if I may, it takes me about five minutes, but I really want to introduce these artists and, and their um, and, and their itineraries. Um, and so it's a lengthy, but I wanted to, I wanted to acknowledge their career here. So the first, um, Joanne Quinones is a mixed media artist working primarily in fibers and ceramics. Their work focuses on African-American and Caribbean history, as well as the intricacies of Afro-Latinx identity. They were selected an Emerging Artist of 2020 by Ceramics Monthly, a Manifest Gallery Annual Prize finalist, and it received an honorable mention for the James Renwick Alliance Chrysalis Award. Their work has been shown nationally, including in the 2020 NCECA Annual Exhibition, The Burdens of History. The Belver Art Center and Akron, Akron Arts Museum. They have an MFA in Studio Art from Indiana University in Bloomington and PhD in English from the University of Iowa. They have had residencies at Vermont Studio Center and were selected for participation this summer at the Arts Industry Residency and Foundry at the John Michael Kohler Art Center. They currently teach sculpture at Albrecht University in New York. Bobby Scrogan was born and raised in Kansas City, Missouri, where he began his artistic career. As he had a young age, he developed an interest in visual arts and began to develop special skills as a sculptor and painter. Scrogan studied sculpture and ceramics at the Kansas City Art Institute, where he received the BFA in 1976. While a student there, he was commissioned to create the Leon M. Jordan Monument in Kansas City. This was the first public monument to be erected to an African-American leader in the state of Missouri. It was also the first public monument to be constructed by an African-American artist in that state. He later received an MFA in the field of sculpture from Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville in 1980, where he was the University at, uh, University at Ford Foundation fellow. Scrolling ceramic vessels and mixed media sculptures have been featured in exhibitions throughout the United States. In 1990, he joined the art department at the University of Kentucky as the head of ceramics and was promoted to full professor in 2015. He has held numerous teaching and administrative positions over Years, director at large, 
for the National Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts, Visual Art Faculty of the Kentucky Governor's School of the Arts and Chairperson of Visual Art Division, Chairperson of the Ceramics and Sculpture Pilot Programs at the Northwest Academy of Arts in Donegal, Northern Ireland, and Derry, Northern Ireland. Keith Wallace Smith, to, to my right, is a figurative sculptor working primarily in ceramics and cast metal with a long standing commitment to making and teaching art. In 1994, he received a bachelor's bachelor of science at Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland, in art, in art education. He graduated, attended excuse me, graduate school at the University of Florida in Gainesville, where he studied ceramics under Nan Smith and then Linda Harbaugh. He received his Master of Fine Arts degree in 1999 and went on to teach and sculpt and exhibit in several different states throughout the East. Currently, he's Associate Professor of Art and Head of the Ceramics Division at Kennesaw State University in Georgia. Smith has received several fellowships and scholarships that have, have helped fund educational and artist residency opportunities, including Border Union's Graduate Fellowship, Dolores, Alden Fellowship, the Shinpo Scholarship, Shinpo, that sounds cool to me. The OIHE <laughs> Graduate Women Minority Fellowship, and Shellan Blue God Residential Scholarship. Um, his teaching and administrative experience includes positions as Associate Educator for the Board of Museum of Art, Program Coordinator of Art, uh, Art and State Buildings at the University of Florida, Teaching Lab Specialist at the University of Florida, Visiting Assistant Professor at Georgia Southern University, and Lecturer Technician at Northern Kentucky University. And lastly, Olivia C. Thompson is a professor in the Department of Art and Art History at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and a former department chair. She has held position as the Director of School of Art at Texas. Uh, Keck University, Department Head at Missouri Mississippi State University, Assistant Dean of the Director of Undergraduate Studies at Virginia Commonwealth, Assistant Dean of Multicultural Affairs at the School of Art Institute of Chicago, the Director of Educational Opportunity Program at New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University. She has served on the boards for the National Council of Education for Ceramics, National Council of Art Administration, and most recently, Love of Arts Alliance. Professor Thomas uh, Thompson's work has been included in galleries and centers and museums such as the Society of Common Contemporary Crafts in Pennsylvania, Baltimore, Clay Works, and or O'Keefe Museum in New York City, Mississippi, the Kentucky Museum of Art and Craft, the Timatura, the Timatura Gallery in New Zealand, and Gittergard in Denmark. She has completed public commissions in businesses, uh, and her work is private, is, is, is private and, and, and and public collections in North Carolina, Virginia, New Mexico, New Zealand, Australia, Switzerland, and Italy. She has conducted workshops and given lectures throughout the United States. Professor Thompson has received her Bachelor of Arts degree from the Ohio State University and her Master of Fine Arts degree from the United Kingdom College of Ceramic at Alfred University. And I wanted to do all of this in quite extensive way, but I wanted to mark their authority. I wanted to mock their authority. We will critique through their lived experience and, and their story, but I wanted to do that on purpose to read all of this out loud. The first question um, relating to the Black Creed, and then what we'll do is for each artist will speak for about five to six minutes for each of their three questions. And then later on, then we'll open up uh, for a conversation with the audience here, as well as in, in the in this room. Okay, so now question one. <laughs> <laughs> what is the relationship between clay and creative black clay? Is there something specific in working with clay? I have no knowledge of ceramics or art. <laughs> I just want to let you know, absolutely nothing. So I'm very curious, is there something specific in working with clay that animates your sort of very labor of creating one? So first question, I'll go through Keith and then, and then we'll go in the reverse. Okay, um, well, I'll start off by saying that <clears throat> really none of us have a great deal of knowledge in terms of clay and black labor. It isn't that much important. 
Um, so I noticed I, I hadn't had a chance to uh, really look at that before coming in. I'm <laughs> very privileged to be in the um, But I did notice a glance to the most of the things that they referenced uh, David Slade, which is basically an almost mythical but real person um, that I believe was out in North Georgia. Is that correct? Uh, so uh, that's really one of the very few uh, African American ceramic artists historically that we know of, and that is documented. And that's probably why I can jump quite a bit because that's, that's kind of great. You know, there's only kind of one and recorded historically. Um, really, and, and this isn't recorded either, some of the relationship between African Americans and uh, black artists and black people was a part of this labor crisis. Right? So the idea of um, you know, labor and, and, and working with black there are brick factories were made by you know, slaves in the you know? And then after that, you know, so the Jim Crow laws put in place, which put African Americans in jail, and then they were slave labor again in another way, brick factories. So um, I was at uh, there's an event called Illuminate in Atlanta, which is one of our local cemeteries, Oakland Cemetery. They have this nighttime really cool exhibition, and one of the artists did. Um, I, I forget what it's called, Luminol, I think. She put them on the bricks and then had this black light over the bricks. And you could actually see the fingerprints of the bricks. And the piece was basically about like these bricks were made. Uh, and, and, you know, thankfully, there's a sort of awakening you know, of like looking at cultural history and that has been kind of erased over time. And the history is sort of about that. But it was about uh, specifically the brick factories there. Um, you know, prior to the Civil War, that we were, if those bricks were all made by slaves, we're walking around them and we don't think about it. We realize that bricks that were made by slaves. Um, so, you know, the history uh, between play and, and, and black labor is, is complicated. Um, now, in terms of current era, I think, you know, we, we're looking at it in sort of different ways, kind of different areas. Um, and the, the labor that we do now is, is really a labor of love. And it, 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 we're in color because we love the material and we're working with it. And the, and the second part of this, uh, you know, we're simply working with them, which is why animates the you know, labor of doing more. I think, uh, you know, and this is across the board, you can't really you know, just say black people, people that work with play, I think they're tactile. Um, and I think that that is something that. That animates the labor of like working with them, right? That we sort of just start working with it. And some people can't stop. I have students you know, that get on the wheel and I'm like, you're not doing anything. You're just you're touching it. I call that petting, you're petting right now. Like, you're focused, you know? um, but I know that those people I'll probably see in Sharon's too are dancing. You know, they may be just in the room because they, have, uh, they can't help themselves, right? Um, so I, I will say that I think there is something. Is inherent play that has to do with creativity, and that certain people that are tap that people that automatically respond to that and, and use that as a as a springboard for creativity. Oh, thank um, you, thank you, Keith, for for the history lesson. Because uh, I've also discovered um, that enslaved people were making bricks. They were actually the slave. Uh, owners would rent out or lease the enslaved people to different uh, factories to make bricks. And if you're in Charleston, South Carolina, you will see the imprints, those fingers uh, in the clay and some of those bricks. And it's, um, and I'll say for me, so I guess we'll get into the history of our connection uh, just African American people's connection to this really soft plastic material. But for me, I think like most of us, it's this instant love. We we touch something, we touch this material, and it's kind of saying to yourself, I'm gonna marry them. You know, like you, you, you see that person across the room, you're like, yep, I'm gonna marry them. And so I think that's what happened to me. I mean, I I knew I was 
this was the right material at the right time for me. So there was no question at all that I had found what I was looking for for a very long time. And I think when we when I talk about creative black labor, I've seen that in my family since I was a, a small child. I've seen my those 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 domestic things that were really related to doing for other people. My mother, I got to see her use that same skill of crocheting and knitting, uh, working with her hands, which I think is is really a dominant thing that you see with anybody who's in a labor field. It's kind of tactile. We become the commodity. We become the machines that are making these these wares. Um, and so I, I got to see at a very early age of how you can use your hands to make something and make something creative. And that, you know, labor is also having a skill set. And so to me, I just was naturally connected to that. Um, and it's the same thing with my father. My father worked with his hands. He did le leather work. He did, um, he, he worked on houses. My grandfather built furniture. My grandmother made quilts. And so I've seen this all along. It was just something that they did. It was something that was in the household. And it wasn't always something. And some, sometimes my father, of course, he did this as a hustle. So I created a hustle for myself at a very early age when I told I, I wanted my mother to teach me how to crochet because I'm thinking of making money off of this. This would be my Christmas money. And so I would make these crochet, these doll dresses and she would take them to work and sell them, you know, for me. And so I learned very early on what labor was not using the word labor to describe what I was doing, but also thinking about a skill set that would enable me to make a profit. So I was making that connection at a very early age. Um, so I would say that my family had a lot to do with me understanding black labor in that way or black creative labor in that way. Um, my grandfather also worked for uh, a company that made the connectors to the, the cars for the, the railroad. So he, he worked on those. So my family migrated from the South. They were part of the great migration and they migrated up for, for a better life. And so, you know, we're part of that too, being from Ohio, but my family being from Mississippi and Georgia. So that I think was really important in terms of understanding that pathway that a lot of labor, black labor, um, the enslaved people, once they were free, that's what they were doing. They were moving from the deep south to Kentucky and Ohio uh, and Pennsylvania for a better life. So labor is connected with wanting something better for yourself, wanting to strive for better and to take care of family. Um, and then I, I also think about the, the idea of, of labor, of black labor, labor and creativity is always linked to something that's utilitarian, religion, food and shelter. So those are the things I think that are so basic in terms of what we need as human beings to exist in this world. And uh, when I was going through my more formative years in college, I recognized that there are uh, cultures and people that look like me that are doing some really beautiful work. And so I needed to figure out how to do that. So recently, um, uh, there was a question that I was asked during one of the Zoom virtual presentations, and they said, is there a way to make <coughs> art without talking about your culture? And no. I mean, I think especially if you're working in ceramics, because everything is linked to a culture and practice. And so there's no way you can, you can deny that. That's how you learn about making vessels and making that connection with food and shelter. I, I, I have a, a, a minute. I, I think I've used my time. So, Bobby. <laughs> Go ahead, Bobby. Well, I'd, I'd like to um, talk about a term that I uh, thought about in college, uh, ancestral channel, channeling, which is something I think we all do as makers. And we actually, uh, are related in ways that we don't understand. Uh, some ways consciously, sometimes unconsciously. As uh, black makers, uh, a lot of our connections 
between ancestral, uh, like it's, 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 those things are not connected from a, from a documented standpoint. So, you know, we, we know sketchy information about what our people did a long time ago uh, on this continent, of course. Although we know that the, the African uh, heritage of, of making is very, very rich. But, you know, we have, you know, some, some examples of that type of thing. I remember, for example, uh, my great grandfather actually worked on the, on the uh, uh, Washington Monument. And, you know, although these, these were skilled craftspeople, they, they, not, they did not get the kind of credit for what they did. So a lot of that information is not handed down to us, uh, literally, uh, from, from uh, textbooks or that kind of thing. Uh, I had another relative that was said to have uh, been uh, an inventor of the cinder block, although never got credit for that kind of thing. So you know those are those are things that we that we are working with, and there's so much uh, misinformation and disinformation about our culture that we are actually reconnecting the act of making creatively, uh, and and actually are re-pioneering uh, the the creative art of, of making working with clay. Uh, so so now we are a generation of uh, makers that uh, hopefully will be building a legacy that uh, future future generations can really uh, benefit from. I think that's one of the important things about this book mm -hmm. is that it's finally starting to recognize African American artists, uh, especially clay people, and uh, given the kind of the importance of that is, is necessary to inspire new generations of makers. So, you know, I um, approach clay in a different way than a lot of people. My, my approach is not out of therapy it's, or anything like that. It's, it's a, a, a approach of need. So I, I create out of need and not out of uh, the desire for attention or that sort of thing. And my uh, original approach with clay it, it, uh, uh, happened as a result of uh, recovery from a serious brain injury. So I look at clay as, as a healing medium, uh, as a medium that uh, helps to uh, keep myself centered and, and, and provide equilibrium, and also a tool for sharing with uh, generations and other people. So. Uh, I find it almost impossible to separate the making of with, with the, the medium that I use with sharing. Uh, they have to they they go together. So that's why it's so important, I think, to uh, to teach and to share what we know, uh, so that those other people can experience the kind of wealth that we that we all experience. I think that we all can agree that. Our ability and our and our uh, opportunities to create the way we do is really a form of wealth, and you know, being able to demonstrate and communicate that this is a form of wealth, a form of healing, a form of, of well-being, uh, it, it transcends the idea of labor, uh, unless you want to call it labor of love. So uh, that's. That's one of the most important things about what we do. Uh, it's not just creating objects, but uh, demonstrating a lifestyle that denies the, uh, the oppressive history and it, it looks toward a, toward a brighter future of creating. Let's see. Hello. Uh, so I think I probably should confess, I probably didn't fall in love with Clay right away, <laughs> as a lot of people here have mentioned. Um, I, uh, as sort of was read a little bit of my bio, my first sort of life, um, I taught English for 17 years. 
Um, so I was an English professor. I read, um, I taught African American and Caribbean literature for a really long time. Um, and basically at a certain point, I kind of had this crisis of faith, right? That like teaching people in the classroom was not cutting it, right? Like it just really wasn't cutting it. And I really had to figure out another way that we could sort of talk to each other because no one was listening to each other. And so I was really sort of obsessed with the visual. Um, and so my first foray actually, like my background is in fibers. <laughs> and when I was in graduate school, I'm trying to make all this stuff with fiber. And then I realized this isn't working, right? And so if I really had to confess, my first love was probably plaster. Because for a really long time, all I had thought about, uh, you know, if you thought about ceramics, it's hand building and wheel throwing, like that was it. Uh, and while I was in graduate school, that's when I got introduced to mold making. And I think mold making and slip casting was the thing for me that really cinched this idea about labor. Um, I make big molds, <laughs> life size body part molds. It's ridiculously labor intensive. Um, there's probably easier ways of doing things, but I choose to do that. There's something that's really intimate about life casting when you're casting someone's face or their hand or their torso. Um, you kind of look at them long enough and you fall in love with them. So even when I'm making these collages and the sculpture, um, and even if I'm talking about race, and even if I'm talking about the erasure of, of black labor, um, there's still this part of me that's loving all the pieces and loving all the people that are sort of trapped in that drama. So my first love being plaster, I think a lot of it has to do with, it was one of the only art terms that I knew in Spanish instinctively. My grandfather was a, a carpenter. And so that I knew the word for plaster was yeso. And so I think, you know, artists are odd. We love the things we love. We went down the rabbit hole of clay and plaster. And then realizing what happens when you put clay on plaster, right? And the beautiful thing about mold making for me and why it's a powerful symbol, you sort of pour this heavy liquid, it absorbs the liquid, you dump it out and you have this shell. Um, and so for me, that's like a perfect metaphor for identity. Um, it's, it's kind of looks like it has a solid form, but it's all really kind of empty in the inside, right? So our identities, who we think we are, is really just sort of shaped by all this pressure on the outside. And we spend a whole bunch of time trying to figure out what's really in the inside. Um, and so a lot of the time when I think about um, the history in the Caribbean, in Puerto Rico, about um, slavery in the transatlantic slave trade, I think about all those individuals <laughs> and the creative opportunities that are really lost, right? Um, in my family, there is no tradition of craft. There is no tradition handed down. I don't have any memories of sitting with my grandmother doing anything, right? Um, my family comes from generations and generations of sugarcane workers. Uh, and the further I kind of go back in my own genealogy, I'm very aware that at some point, I don't know the names of my family members because someone wanted sugar in their tea, right? Or sugar in their coffee. Uh, and so what do you kind of do with that as an artist? How do you kind of express that grief? And so mold making and making multiples for me, um, it's labor intensive and it also sort of highlights that dilemma of, um, you know, the biggest tragedy, and this is from like C. Riley Snorton, art historian, um, the biggest tra tragedy of the transatlantic slave trade was this idea of racial fungibility, um, that one black person's body was completely interchangeable for another, as if there was no distinctiveness. Um, and so I kind of do amazingly, ridiculously labor-intensive processes to kind of honor, I think, in a way, um, it's kind of like that obsession with the material goods has had a profound impact. Um, so the way that I want to make these things that talk about the individuals behind the material goods, 
I wanted to be respectful and labor intensive, if that makes any sense. So um, yeah, what animates specifics with working with play? Um, I'm really interested in that material objects and the way I do a lot of historical research and museum research. Um, and the things that people choose to collect really tell you who the society at large thinks is important and matters. And so a big part of what I try to do in my work is make fake artifacts. How do you make fake artifacts that talk about um, all those dynamics? all those uh, global dynamics um, that sort of shaped where you are at this present moment. So yeah, I love casting. I love mold making. <laughs> I like plaster. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll stick there. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to also improvise a little bit too here, given, given how each artist um, share their thoughts on, on this relationship. Um, the second question, some of us already, some of some of these artists have already kind of alluded to making connections between labor, creating art, this particular labor that's sometimes it's intricate, but it's it's sort of joy I'm saying it's one of the, the labor intensive part is very um, intriguing to me. It may be a labor intensive through the art history and art making, but it in the process kind of fight against this, what she was saying, the fungibility in distinction, oh, sorry, the distinction is rendered sort of erased um, through, through the sort of extreme form of exploitation and dispossession. So to counter that, so labor intensive, focusing on labor intensive allows allows different kind of meaning. But, but I, why, what I wanted to do initially was to just come up with a different kind of associations um, so that artists can can imagine um, and could go deeper into the interiority of, of their art making. So these are some of the keywords that I kind of came up with, and I think Lydia also kind of over and then both uh, uh, Bob, Bobby um, Sprogan too mentioned family connection to family history. Mm -hmm. So that's one category that I came up with: childhood memories, spirituality. Humor, food ways, food ways kind of came up in sugarcane kind of context. Ancestors, obviously, what we were just talking about, ancestral channeling, which is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flag that and use that in different ways. It's so much that it's giving us a portal through which we enter and see the myriad ways in which Black people engage in the labor uh, process in art making. And even that labor and art making the boundaries in many ways below to um, animal plant life movements. And this is something that I really mentioned about migrations to movements I was thinking about in terms of social movements as well. But music, various types of sound, theater, performance, poetry, the specificity of place and, and, and space. Um, so that broader Afro diaspora, historical, historical experiences, or other the more connection to regions that are not seen as a central to this Black historical experience. So my work is on Afro Asian connections, not at all connected to our whole little bit of um, not at all connected to that. But I'm so intrigued by these spaces and, and connection making that I accept. And I know that one thing that really actually threw me was Chosani worked in the media and on her art history and craft in India. So I was like, oh my God, you do art for Asian research. And then she's also interested in Portugal and all the kind of the Portuguese imperial expansion and the ports in Japan, a place called Nagasaki. Well, one of the few ports during the feudal times that opened to the wider world for the enslaved African peoples came into contact with Japanese people this in the 1500s. But anyway, so these are some of the, I think, the ways in which I feel like these artists are exploring these different routes and identities. 
But any, anything that maybe you, any of these key categories kind of jump at you in some ways, um, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, put you on the spot, but any of you, if these categories um, um, made you think differently about your work or help you clarify your mm -hmm. label? It's for me, most of them. <laughs> most of them, okay. You know, I'm very, like, uh, you know, I think a lot of times, uh, have a certain thing that they they do. And mine is maybe it's figured in there, um, but it, within that is very really very broad. Uh, the issues I address and the things I'm looking at, and this, you know, several like you just piece many different things, right? So part of it you say you know family history or childhood. To start off with, my mother used to read uh, stories to me as a child as a kid. I love books and reading. Uh, because my mom was writing stories. In stories, I love stories. I uh, love the, the idea of narrative. And so John Henry was a story that, that probably stuck with me from a very young age. Um, but at the same time, there's also the idea that this is connected to African-American history, right? And, and it's not John Henry was an actual real person, at least as far as we know. Um, but it's a folk tale that was carried forward. And again, we don't have, or some of our folk tales have been sort of Prepackaged and taken by other people, but um, you know John Henry is one that sort of uh, you know how many African American hero figures do we have uh, even in folk? And John Henry is, is sort of one of them uh, that stands out. And um, even spirituality, right? So this is really like the piece that's in the show is is John Henry is taking his last step. He's, he becomes a martyr uh, in that he he sort of Fights the machine, he goes up against the steam engine, and they go through the, like the tunnel through the mountain. It's a race, and he wins. You know? But he takes it out two steps and dies. So, this is the piece of the show, it's his last set, and he's looking up to God. So, there's an idea of sort of uh, spirituality and looking up in the piece as well. So, a lot of these, these categories are things that, you know, even in a single piece, kind of overlap and feed and add to. I think, I think I, uh, one of the categories that stands out to me is specificity of place and space. And I kind of added to that list that you had um, and included failure, stress, heritage, tradition, um, lacking in experience, genetics, and struggle. Because I think you know, as a as an African American woman living in the United States and having lived in various regions in the United States, you know, there are things that are just the same no matter where I go, and then there are things that enable me to grow. And uh, I think where I am right now has enabled me to really do a three sixty or complete the three sixty. Um, I think you know when I was starting out. And, and, and reading the books and being educated, it was, it was you know, I didn't have any African-American faculty uh, in ceramics. I, I knew of, uh, you know, Winnie Owens and I knew of David McDonald and they were far in a distance, but, you know, there were the, that, that group. I mean, everybody wants to feel that there are role models out there. There are people who have succeeded. And um, those were the only two that I could, that were making ceramics at the time. I mean, who, who were in the forefront that I could see that their images were actually being published in any type of art magazine. And, um, you know, it was, it was enough though, just having those two was enough for me to think that I was headed in the right direction. So I think that being in a right space um, having mentorship or having whatever that is to help you help support whatever you're doing, I think is really important. And as far as failure, I mean, clay is all about failure. You know, mm -hmm. it is just all about failure. And, but it's also about success. But I think it enables you to be um, really committed and 
you know, I'm, I'm thinking about Joanne being a writer, and I'm thinking, boy, why didn't I try to do that, you know? <laughs> Man, I could carry that all over the place with me. But, you know, I think it was the determination, you know, and that's part of the labor, you know. It's, it's labor-intensive. And I recognize that, you know, there weren't a lot of African-American students doing ceramics. I mean, it was seen as blue-collar work. I mean, even back then, it was seen as blue collar, and I wore the clay on my my clothes as an honor, a, a badge of honor. You know, I just thought, wow, I'm, I feel like I'm really doing something. But um, I, I think I wanted to learn about all those traditions, and I think the traditions were always linked to somebody else's culture. And when I I, I finally, you know, determined that I know there has to be people who look like me who are doing some really beautiful work out there and I have to figure out what that might look like. Now, the stress that I'm speaking of is when a faculty member or, you know, a teacher, when you say, I want to do a report on West African pottery and they make a statement such as, well, stop being so black. And, you know, you just think, well, okay, I don't, I don't know what that means. Um, but I, I think those are the things about the failure and those things that when you talk about not having the support there, I think those things are important and they really play into your psyche to a certain extent. And you have to figure out where what you're going to do with that information so you can press on and try to be successful and reach those goals that you might have. So it's a, it's a spirituality, which, you know, I've always been conflicted with the sacred and the secular because, again, I go into museums and I look at the work that's collected. And I think, well, if these artworks from of different cultures are seen as paganism or whatever that practice is, then why are they included? In, why are we honoring them? Why are we collecting these objects? And why are they not seen as important um, uh, objects in terms of contribution to cultures? So I've always had that issue with you know, the Christianity and how that influences and impacts what we value in our society as far as art is related to. I'll stop there and let someone else go. I look at art making as a spiritual practice. Uh, it is a, a connection with a material that has millions, maybe billions of years of history. You know, when I teach and I talk about this material we're using, this is a material that at one point in time was probably some kind of living being and uh, it had life, it animated life. And, and through the processes of years and years of decomposition and, and uh, you know, climatic change and, and various things that take place, you know, this material has now become something that we have uh, a relationship with that connects us with eons of, of life. Uh, so I, when I when I think about my actual art making, uh, in some ways it's a form of prayer. It's a, it's a form of uh, giving uh, appreciation to the, the creator that created me and gave me the ability to do what I do. And so I, I look at myself not necessarily as the creator, but more of an instrument. Uh, so, and I, I do believe that all good ideas are divinely inspired. And so that we are, we're doing what we're doing uh, in some ways uh, from an egotistical uh, position. But in reality, I think that we're, what we're doing is we are also doing uh, uh, channeling through, uh, you know, a, a, a higher power. What you call it. There is a, a passage for those of you who, have, who may follow a, a, a Judeo a Christian uh, that actually is, is one of, the, I think, one, a remote and hidden passage that talks about art making and artists. And uh, it's actually in uh, Exodus thir uh, 31 and Exodus 35, and it talks about these guys. Bezalel, son of Hu, and, uh, and uh, uh, let's see, uh, Oliohad. And it said that uh, he was 
given the spirit of God and all wisdom and knowledge of art and making things. As an expert in design, designing beautiful things, working gold and silver, brass, clay, <laughs> trained in the cutting of stones and ornamenting of wood and every sort of handwork. And is also given, uh, he's given to him and to Oyohab, the son of Ahisamach, the, the, uh, the tribe of Dan, the power of training others. So that really speaks uh, about a very uh, cosmic connection between what we do as makers and as thinkers. So I think it's a really important thing to recognize that, that even though we may not be doing what we do from a religious concept or perspective, that we are connected uh, in a universal way with something that goes beyond what we can see. So our energy and our inspiration uh, it's not something we have actually created, but we've been blessed with. So that's what stands out to me. Um, I think I really, I, I really do resonate with that idea of creativity as this option. Like it gives us this ability um, to make connections. And so, uh, you know, I love terracotta, right? Because it sort of connects all the parts of, of, of sort of this hybrid identity <laughs> I kind of inhabit. Um, and I really like that ability of, of, of play to connect me through time and space with different cultures and different traditions. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, some of the other things that I said earlier, but like this particular piece is part of a Vejigante series. Um, and Vejigante is our folklore, uh, Puerto Rican folklore tradition where um, people dress up as devils um, and, you know, it's like a carnival tradition and it's very fascinating because it's supposed to be like the expulsion of the Moors from Spain, right? Um, and I, I really sort of, I'm always really uh, fascinated by how hard it is to really talk, I think, for a lot of people connected to uh, Latin America that uh, Latin America is a major part of the African diaspora. Mm -hmm. And that there's so much of a denial um, or an ability to speak about it because, like, I look at the devils and we're talking about the Moors, and then mm -hmm. the Vegigante tradition is in the places in Puerto Rico where there's the largest Black populations. And you're going to try to tell me that there's not a connection <laughs> to West Africa in any way. And so, like, clay allows me, I think, you know, so in this piece, um, I'm trying to, this one is called Mulata which is the Spanish racial classification term for someone who is Black and Spanish, Black and white, right? Um, and so I think that's what I do love about the ability of play. You carry that history when you use it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're able, you know, so I'm really interested in what does it mean when you have sort of two cultures come together and that line, that very fine line, right, where I think a lot of people who see themselves as carrying different cultural traditions. Um, you know, race totally is dependent on where you are and who you're standing next to <laughs> a lot of the time, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so I'm really interested in trying to create um, artifacts that talk about what it's like to carry multiple traditions and play does help me do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, play does help me do that. Awesome. Um, I uh, the idea of history, um, historicity, and clay um, is it, very intriguing to me. I uh, I have a colleague now who just joined the Department of African American Studies. And he's uh, he's from Ethiopia. He identified himself as a oral, oral most indigenous people uh, in East Africa. But he, he's an archaeologist, trained as an archaeologist. And for him, it's all about clay. The pottery, if that's specifically women, the oral women, like after pottery women, for like literally like centuries, like when we, I, I don't know, it goes back way back um, to the place where we don't have any access, no written text or that, just the material that were the objects that were unearthed from, from the man. And these women are still practicing similar techniques of pottery 
and he all his work about the sort of the, the prehistory. <laughs> and so he's thinking like the cos like I used to use the cosmic, but he does, I really do feel like he's cosmological thing. The cosmology is something else entirely different than how, how we the Westerners have come to come to see the world. Anyways, and I also discovered that the Oromo people have come up with the indigenous system of governance um, and that is quite democratic, not the sovereignty that West enshrines. And way before this Western world have granted women the rights, um, Oromo people have granted them. They were feminists well before you know, we have come to but and then these are the women that were that have continued to like make positive. So the gender dimension is kind of quite quite significant. And anyway, that's just my own commentary about what I'm learning about how there is a history. But I mean, it, it's, it really draws me that we can get to prehistory, so-called prehistory, through through powerful. So I really do consider artists as a sort of a, you know sort of story types and then it's interesting to keep this possible sense. Um, but anyway, I wanted to now turn to the last question, and Lydia always goes two steps ahead of me, but I <laughs> so she alluded to, to what, it, what it feels, what it means, what, what the experience of inhabiting the, the, the canon of contemporary ceramic art, um, or institutional higher learning as a, as a Black ceramic art, artist. This relationship, I believe, is quite vexed. And um, so, what is the, I mean, that just a general kind of framing again the question what is your opinion about the established field of contemporary ceramics, including as it exists within the institution of higher learning or education, or in relation to other areas of study? I mean, already they are working across different mediums. That's something that I, that's just quite kind of intrinsic to their. Practice by drawing and painting photography, because I'm sure those are the only things that I come up with. I'm sure there are other fields, but in a field of art. But specifically, how, how would you characterize Black ceramic artists' relationship to the canonical authority, something that's established um, in contemporary ceramics? Um, is it like any other institution of higher learning or academic discipline, which is to say, remains stubborn and historically white? Uh, do you transgress boundaries? If so, how? Do you rework it from within? If so, how? Or do you have a distinct method of habitation uh, of your own? Or do you have it in a space that is to say you don't even try to, you know, basically seek validation from canonical authority or an institution? What is your, if, if that's the case with you, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling as a faculty. I always struggle. I don't. I. I, I don't want to see validation from the institution, but you know your career is tied up. Yeah. You want to get promoted. Yes. And you yes. want to make your work legible to the master. And I just, it's hard. So then I want to be in that space. But the paradigm will be like, I don't want you. I will chart my path. Mm -hmm. But it. You know, it's, it's not so easy. And as you can see, all of them are connected to higher ed, um, means of survival. And, but, so that, that, that in itself, asking this question, I think gets to the core of what they do. And then above all, they're creating. So that's why I'm asking this question. But also, I should give credit to where credit is due, but Chosani also had a conversation with Chosani as well. I wanted to put this out there front and center. Mm -hmm. Anyone take that question? I mean, you know, as I was saying earlier, there's a certain amount of racial, a large amount of racial, but certainly, um, you know, African and particularly in ceramics, there's only so many um, African Americans that have been sort of historically recorded. Uh, that's, you know, that sort of makes this book, I think, very significant, you know, right turning point. You know, that, that, um, you know, here we have a, a book. Compiled by African American ceramic artists, um, and that has uh, happened uh, previously. That I haven't seen that. Um, so there's there has been uh, some acknowledgement, right? You know, 
which objectives uh, you know, David and, and Simon used to sign on and you know, it's art and, and have, there's a couple that have been included to some extent, but um, not to the extent that you have like a, a Vulcus, you know, Vulcus or uh, you know, some of the, the white contemporaries that have uh, entire, you know, volumes of books on them and their lives and their work. Um, you know, we, we really haven't had that kind of representation. And hopefully, you know, this, this is a point where we're turning the corner. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I would say that, that um, you know, the currently, I think there's a, a, a hopefully both generations are, are starting to to uh, wake up a little bit to uh, different cultures and different people and different people's contributions. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll see more books like this in the future. Uh, and, uh, and as far as the, the canon of ceramics is concerned, hopefully we'll see more uh, representation of uh, people of color. I think it really starts, uh, something Bobby touch, touched on is it, it really starts K through 12. I mean, it, it just, it does. And, um, and this is just speaking about art in general. Uh, just, if you teach ceramic history, you do not need to teach anything else. It has, it's all there for you. It's geography, it's geology, it's science, it's talking about, you know, uh, civilization and the evolution of civilization. If we could start there somehow, um, and Joanne touched on a few of these things too with the objects that are in museums, things that are collected, but um, I, I think it does kind of start there. It, it really does speak to uh, what a career might look like for a ceramic artist, even if we are talking about spirituality, why we create, that we must create. There's, there's a moment there where there has to be an explanation or there has to be, you have to define, you have to help the student who may be struggling with this, how to determine if they can make this work. And I think more than any time ever that I've been making ceramics is, is a moment where there are different institutions that are supporting young artists, young black and brown artists. Um, especially ceramic artists. I mean, I'm seeing things that Nsika is doing and Northern Clay Center is doing. I met a young lady last night at the opening who she is, she has a fellowship there. She's a resident there. So those types of things are, are, are popping up and they're generating support and they're showing, the institutions are showing the commitment to that. You know, unfortunately, unfortunately, you need a facility to make ceramics i mean and to make it safely you have to have a space you have to understand again getting back to the science of it and health and safety those are things that are important long time ago they weren't important you smoking a cigarette and mixing a glaze using red lead and walking <laughs> down the in the, the glaze lab barefoot i mean it's crazy i don't even how do we i don't know if that child is living now i don't know where she is but all i'm saying is that um as far as that is concerned i do see the population growing and the interest growing um i think you know an institution there's so many ways uh to support your your studio practice with ceramics in higher education is one. Um, I see, I'm meeting young people who are interested in ceramics who are finding other ways to do that. So I don't think that's the only way to maintain your studio practice. It's just that I'm so steeped in it now <laughs> that, um, you know, that, that I've made that commitment for myself as well. But, um, you know, I'm encouraging students. I think it's important to have diversity in the classroom for not only the, the students of color, but even our white students. It's just important that they see the full spectrum of the field and that, and that those faculty can speak from their own personal experiences and their professional experiences and that they can be interested in other things besides people who look like them who make ceramics. They're, we're influenced by 
and inspired by many things in ceramics and outside of ceramics. And that no one can tell us, well, you should be making this and you should only be looking at this artwork. It's like we look at everything. That's, we're sponges. I mean, an artist is a sponge. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, um, then you need to squeeze out which, whatever's in that sponge and start all over again <laughs> and start absorbing again. But, but I, I'm not, I know there, are, we have two other wonderful professionals who will speak on that, but I think that's kind of what the, the key is. I just think um, once you get those people, those faculty of color in positions, you know, understand that they may speak differently than you. They may look different from you and that what they are saying is just as important as what other everybody else is contributing to the dialogue. Mm -hmm. I'm Good. done. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, art making requires courage and requires passion. And, and serious art making requires persistence. Although those are very, very valuable qualities that, that uh, people have to have in order to do what they do. Uh, you know, when I talk about my my path, I'm, I guess I'm the oldest one here. So, I would, you know, <laughs> you, you talk about the opportunities that are, that are available to young creators now, you know, makers now. And when I was coming through, that wasn't necessarily the case. I came through knocking down doors, and refusing to go away, and um, just, just staying with it. And dealing with rejection and, uh, you know, in some ways being uh, put, you know, just not even what well, people didn't even know what to do. You know, when I showed up at, at the Art Institute, some people were going, what are you doing? You guys don't do that kind of stuff. I even recall at the university, you know, a, a student at one point, uh, one later in the day was asking me uh, something about, uh, why are you here so late? Don't you guys get off at three o'clock? And, and he was thinking that maybe I was custodian. You know, uh, I was supposed to be pushing the broom as opposed to teaching. So there's a level of uh, that kind of thing that is a, we have differences in our experiences, which is, is very important to, to uh, reflect on. Uh, because my path is quite a bit different from some others that are coming along now. Uh, so although we're all pioneering, you know, we're still having to deal with uh, issues of tone deafness uh, uh, within the institutions that we're working with. So there's still people that don't get it yet, and, and we still have to continue to, 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 to do what we do. Uh, Although I have credentials uh, from universities and, and you know, uh, colleges and things like that, I actually, uh, I would really consider myself to be mainly self-taught uh, because within those organizations, there were very often times where people just didn't know what to do with me. And so I was forced to learn how to do things on my own, how to create different ways of doing things. Some of those ways were very, very, uh, unorthodox and that can you know uh, be demonstrated in some of the pieces that I have in the book you know? so and so in, in many ways that became a mixed blessing and that becoming a problem solver as a result of being left to your own devices uh, to my own devices was was uh, a way that helped me mature as an artist and become self-sufficient and it also, uh, you know, uh, gave me uh, a, a lot of insight as, as a teacher, as an educator, in terms of helping people to, to identify the ways that they're struggling with. So it's really important that, that we are highly visible. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not only important for those young people that look like us that are coming through, mm -hmm. but it's really, really important for people of, of the uh, dominant culture to see us and for us to destroy those stereotypes that, that still are alive and well, those stereotypes that, that may question our validity, uh, you know, our expertise, you know, and those kind of things. And we're still knocking on those barriers every day. I still, 
every semester, and I, and I teach at a, a traditionally white institution, and every semester I, I know that there are students that for the first time in their lives, they're confronted with a, a black professor, you know, someone that they were, were not prepared to, to, uh, to be learning from and to, to have authority over. So, I mean, th those kind of things, are, they have their value in themselves. So it's very important that, uh, that we are still around doing those things. But I, I do want to talk about this other thing called persistence. I was having a conversation earlier with a friend of mine back there in the back that we were talking about, you know, talent. And uh, the greatest protect, the greatest talent that I know of is not necessarily you know, the ability to create things and uh, do things with ease. Their greatest talent is persistence. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the things that is uh, something that we have inherited, uh, again, from our ancestors, you know, uh, and our, our elders, you know, from is, is being able to stay with whatever it is we decide to do. And so this, that, that, is a, that is one thing that will, keep us going, because if we remember that, that all the obstacles that we over, that we were confronted with are things that we eventually will overcome. And so though that, that transcends art that goes to any discipline that, that uh, you could ever think about, but in particular, it's important for, for artists. Um, so I got my degree in my MFA in 2019 and I was super excited and I was thinking oh I would love to have a ceramics job and um, I went to an interview and they read me for about 15 minutes all the duties that they would expect a ceramic instructor to, to have <laughs> and I cried and I was like oh no I can't I can't do that right so if you've ever ever get a chance uh to hear that um, you would cry right it was like maintain the metal shop the wood shop clean, uh, take care of all the kilns, teach all the classes, all levels that are all stacked, <laughs> uh, teach hand throwing, uh, hand hand building, wheel throwing, mold making, new technologies. I mean, I like literally, I left the interview crying. Um, and part of, part of the crying is, um, you know, the institutions want you to do all these things. Um, and in my mind, I'm going, oh my God, that's a career killer, right? That is an art life killer. Um, so really trying to find that balance between what the institution needs um, and what what you would like to give, I think, has been a big struggle um, in terms of academia. And I know it's so actually at Alfred, I teach fibers and mixed media. Um, and guess what? I, I advise and mentor. It's the invisible work. A lot of um, the black and brown students, regardless of what discipline they're in, um, and especially the ones in ceramics, right? So, um, so when I think about uh, uh, the labor in academia, that's what I, I think a lot of um, sort of these really large expectations that, that people have for artists, how difficult it is to maintain that balance with an artistic life. The other thing that I think about in terms of ceramics as a field, um, it kind of reminds me a lot of like, you know, in English, if you want to study literature of the Caribbean, you have to kind of decide what language you're going to study. You can't study the whole Caribbean, right? Mm -hmm. And even though you tell them, uh, that's just like following that whole pattern of colonization before, people are like, don't care. If it's in English, it has to be written in English, or it won't count for the English degree, right? Um, and sometimes I feel a little bit like that about ceramics in uh, academia. There's a lot of sort of gatekeeping in terms of like, this is the kind of knowledge that you have to have in order to have it be this. Um, and so I think as educators, especially uh, um, as a black educator, I really think it's so important to make um, access to information to students and to support them. Um, regardless of, of, of what I may think the center of the field may be. I think a lot about Audre Lorde and um, when she wrote um, Zami and you spelling my name of biomethography, new experiences need to have a new form. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, really sort of hoping that there's uh, an ability to push at the edges of what constitutes ceramics 
it's kind of scary. Um, but I think for uh, a lot of folks, especially who find themselves in the margins, it's pushing at the edges. Um, that's really going to advance the field and keep it exciting, I think, for a, a diverse generation coming up. So that's kind of my mm -hmm. hot academic take moment. <laughs> um, well, I want to thank all the artists here thus far for sharing these wonderful insights. Now, I want to actually turn, I think we have time, maybe not. Turn to audience for another 10, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's do that. I do have a question, and I hope I'm speaking loud and clear. Uh, I believe in a, the institution of academia, and I did not get a degree in teaching to become a teacher in ceramics. But I learned my education through community art centers and through community engagement. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, there will be people that will be more interested in doing it. But my question is, do you, in academia, still believe that community engagement, when you reach out to the community, that you can bring those people from the community into the institutions? Because I, I got impressed by it. And, but I, Asking you all that same question because I, I, I learned the other way 20 something years ago through community art centers, and I'm in the living right now. Yeah, I can go, I can answer that. I, I absolutely I think it's a very important fact. We, we, we are very seriously engage in that type of thing, even within the institution where, where uh, we have lifelong learning mm -hmm. for uh, people that. Uh, they feel the need to create and they don't want to have to go through the rigors of academia in order to do that. And so, yeah, that's, that's vitally important. I, I think art making solves a lot of problems, and, you know, for, for a lot of things. You know, I think that, that uh, some of the problems that we may have in our society right now in regards to a lot of, you know, the violence and the disproportionate levels of addiction things like that. We have to do with uh, a disconnection from people's creativity. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really important that we have those kind of community centers because sometimes they do that much better than, they serve people better than the, than the academic institution can because they're closely connected. And it's so very important to have people that are, that are willing to go out into the community, whether they have an academic background or whatever, and, and, to, and to share that information. So, I, I, because I, even with young people, I think in the absence of creativity, we tend to have more uh, destructiveness. You know, we have, you know, have uh, people who are, are creatively frustrated. You know, they don't have outlets that, that they can that, that, that they can attach themselves to and feel and have a feeling of accomplishment you know, or a feeling of value within the community. So I, I think it's vitally important to have facilities like that. Uh, my hats off to the, the, the new program that's coming up, uh, the Black Youth uh, Art Healing Community, what is that? Yeah, yeah. I think that's going to be a tremendous asset, you know, to the community uh, in terms of providing those kind of creative outlets. We do very well with sports, okay, in terms of reaching out to our young people and and creating and, and providing heroic role models and those kind of things. But we've done a poor, poor job as a society in terms of uh, providing that, that kind of outlet and the kind of energy and, and the acceptance accept, uh, for young people to attach themselves to. So I'm hoping that in the future, those kind of things will, will develop more so than what they are right now. And, and if I could just add, speaking from uh, kind of a higher education, uh, perspective is that um, what's starting to happen is 
that is pivoting now where we are looking for faculty who have a social justice practice. So, you know, we're not so much interested anymore with the traditional 40, 40, 20, which is our percentage of where we are supposed to spend our time, 40% in the classroom, 40% in our teaching, or excuse me, uh, uh, research and the other 20% in service. And um, I think, you know, unfortunately, fortunately with the pandemic, it did open up different ways for us to think about how we teach um, that it doesn't always have to be in person or we don't have to have meetings in person, you know, faculty meetings in person or whatever the committee we're on. We don't have to do that in person. So that gives us more time to, to kind of move and spend our energy in a community somewhere. Um, and that, you know, your research may not always look like having your work in a major art museum or a collection, or maybe what you're doing is you're, you're doing more social engagement, you're working with communities, um, and you're really, you're changing lives, basically. And you're giving them a different skill set that they can apply, that's applicable to not just wanting to become an artist, but to be critical thinkers. I'm sorry to sound like some research person, I'm not, but, um, I just think that I see it happening, but I, but there is fear. There is fear in that because you take the st the ones who are in the position who have held the line, it's slow for that to change. So the, the individuals who are maybe looking at the applications for these positions may not have the, they may not have the expertise or the knowledge to really evaluate these applications for the people we like to hire. So I think that is problematic too when you don't have diversity. We don't, there's, there are already faculty who, whose practice looks like that. Their research already looks like that. And I don't think that's the only way to get information, uh, especially in ceramics, it's very accessible. Um, so I, I, I do think it's changing slowly, but it, there is, I'm seeing some changes and differences. Yeah, I, um, the community art center, those spaces, places where Bob was talking about self-taught tradition mm -hmm. is harnessed, you know, the autodidactic kind of orientation outside the institution. It's very powerful, obviously, but oftentimes come down to the issue of funding and resources. You, you know, we, we, are, we are inviting you know, more resources to be allocated in those directions. And sometimes you think that like that is the source of resources. Not really the case. The pecking order is quite quite well defined. But it is a battle. We all we all internally within fight, fight or fight fight to redirect, mm -hmm. redistribute, yeah. um, and it's, it's our aim to fight. Um, other questions from our yes. sisters? Uh, I know there's something that's happening different on the secondary level. So I know that you were talking about the importance of K-12, and it is true, mm -hmm. because if you look at a lot of programs around the country with K-12, there is, you know, especially, you know, you know less minus negative private schools and specialty areas, the arts are not treated as if they are important at all, except for recreation needs. Yes. And so you will find amongst faculty that whoever teaches an art course, whether it's a performance-based piece or it's a special digital art piece, that we are there to be an aside to what is important they are for. And then you have to convince them, you know what, where would we be as a site if we did not have the arts? Because the arts serves on so many different levels. In terms of being the record keepers of what's happening in society, in terms of also, in a way, signifying the uh, critical and uh, intellectual and artistic uh, well being of a particular society. So then you have to keep the educating over and over again. But what's happened recently, especially in DC, is that they're thinking about re, you know, completely changing the whole approach to teaching 
And they're talking about eliminating the traditional methods of students going to class and having a traditional schedule, and now start focusing on particular projects for like nine weeks or so, where a student could create a project that involves science and involves math and involves involve history and involves English. And I always laugh because I'm saying, you know, that we need a work on our project. I mean, we are doing it. I'm just saying, we're doing something new. Yeah, yeah you're like, we already doing that. What's up? <laughs> uh, but that's how I'm doing that. Then they say, so then they won't have to take a class. So, and then the thing is that arts fall within that thing called elective because they don't see it as core. So they said, well, we'll, we'll pick out an art thing. And then we'll bound it with what we do because what we're serious. And so I'm wondering if that's going to happen, you know, on a collegiate level, you know, where they're trying to say, well, you know, kids aren't going to school, so how do we get them to go to school? And I don't know if we're having an issue with people not wanting to go to college as much anymore and pursue certain specialties. So do you think that there's some kind of transformative change is going to occur like that? And then what does that mean for areas that we consider specialties? Um, uh, and in survival, because we still need to eat, and it's still learning. Uh, so I was just curious to see what you guys thought about that. Okay, so everybody's looking at me. No, I can. I'm looking at you. I look at myself. I'm going to jump in. All right. So well, you know, uh, I, I, unfortunately, it's possible to receive a, a good education uh, without having an art experience in the, within that particular thing. Mm -hmm. And so what we find is there's there's uh, something that happens amongst uh, well, so-called well-educated people. I call it visual illiteracy or yeah. cultural illiteracy. Well, you're well educated in some ways, but you really have to, again that tone deafness that takes that, that exists among decision makers. And so that's what we've been dealing with for a long time. So, uh, in other words, what, what literature uh, was referring to is where, you know, you, uh, if you go to work and you get your hands dirty, then you're not well educated, you know. Uh, and, and yeah, we do a lot of things. In art and in, in ceramics, especially, we were involved in chemistry. We were involved in, in, in uh, the, the history. We were involved in geology. We were involved, in, you know, all kinds of different uh, disciplines in many, many different ways. When we are creating, what we're, we're involved in what we do. So that's very, very important, but it's not recognized like it should be. Uh, you know, uh, I think that there is. A level of wealth of, of higher education that needs to recognize crafts, and also needs to recognize uh, you know, other types of skills. We have we have you know communities where, uh, in the last thirty or forty or fifty years, where the the uh, emphasis has gotten away from people developing their manual skills, and therefore what happens is you have communities now where nobody knows how to do anything. You know, uh, well educated, so called, but you know, can't swing a hammer, you know, can't cut a board, you know, can't fix a window, and those things are those are very very important things that I think that I kind of problem solving develops the mind so that you can actually not be intimidated by those kind of things and you can actually learn. So I, I, my experience too is like by working with clay. It's, it's helped me to become a problem solver in so many different ways. And that's one of the things that we need to really emphasize in education. And that, that these experiences help actually uh, help to uh, enhance the, the intellectual growth of people. Uh, you know, there's there's been a lot of uh, research uh, from uh, famous neurologists that are questioning whether the hands teach the brain or whether the brain teaches the hands. Mm -hmm. And there's so much information there that, that is coming forth about how important it is for people to make things, you know, not only in, in terms of their personal growth, but in terms of uh, developing other types of skills and having all kinds of uh, pathways into uh, you know, different ways of living. 
I think uh, just in terms of the academy or higher education, I think, you know, it depends on what institution you go to. And just speaking of state institutions and what our demographics look like, I mean, the majority of our students, they work a part-time job. Some of them are working full-time. So they're they're battling that. Um, they, they may have families. I mean, there, there's a lot that's happening now in their own personal lives. Um, and even the art students, there's a, there seems to be a level of being them being able to be fully engaged in what they're doing. Um, I think, you know, to always think about curriculum across the entire uh, university and enabling our students to all students to have some opportunity to have art in front of them, either if they're in a like an art appreciation class or it's a hands-on experience or an exhibition or when Tosani came and did a presentation. Um, and in her experience, she's talking about the full experience of being a human being as a maker. And that included her Fulbright to India, but just those things get planted in the student. We may not always see it directly. It's not a direct gratification for us. You may get that gratification down the road. And I think that's all we could do is just put it out in the atmosphere and put it out in a positive way, in a realistic way that if you want to do this, it is labor intensive, but it's, a, it's wonderful. And, you know, they may not connect with it today or tomorrow. They may connect with it when they're in their, their profession and they get tired of sitting in front of a screen and they're like, I'm going to go take a ceramic class and I'm going to go to Northern Play Center. And that's what they're doing. I'm sure there are some students who are like that and, and who are your who are students. And I guess maybe the expectation is not everybody's gonna be this full serious ceramic artist or artist, but they're they're just gonna engage with the material in their own way. So that's how I think about what I can do. And uh, that's why I did the workshop. You know, I, I don't think I'm the best workshop person. Uh, you know, it's like watching water boil, uh, hand builders. Uh, but I felt it was important for me just to be in the space again, you know, to be in that space and just to share that information, even though they were thinking about homecoming and who's going to get named the homecoming king and queen. Somebody's listening to what I'm, what I'm talking about. So I appreciate when those kind of opportunities come my way because it's a way for me to get back and do what I say I'm, I'm going to do because I know how that one voice might have changed me in a, in, in a positive way. I'm going to go ahead and to some extent with education from our capitalistic society. <laughs> um, you know, when you look at, at sort of K-12, the first thing to go is the card. Uh, you know, 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 as far as having a grounded human being, you know, you know, you know, you know, and ironically, uh, you know, in terms of making money, innovation is a big money maker, and that is creativity and creativity is art, you know, so they really need to rethink it. Um, about the importance of art, uh, not just in, in terms of balance and uh, balance of food, but you know, it, even in terms of industry and, uh, and input and creativity. Uh, and I think you know, some companies, especially with these sort of startups and stuff like that, they do, you know, they do sort of look at creativity and, and uh, innovation. And, getting, and I've actually had you know requests for like ceramics people or something. Shoe companies or you know, car companies or something. You think about it, you know, there's engineers, there's a ton of engineers, you know, but you know, one of the things that really sells that is you know, sort of graphic component, but also the three-dimensional component of stuff. So, you know, I think um, unfortunately, uh, you know, as, as with many things in our society, we really need to sort of rethink uh, you know how important. Uh, the arts are in two dimensional arts. And um, you know, unfortunately, now when we get uh, students in higher education, you know, a lot of times there's these portfolios that come in, they're all two dimensional because uh, they just haven't had any exposure. And then they take 3D design and some of them are, oh my God, 
<laughs> so cool. Yeah, yeah. What if I could do with my life? You know, um, you know. But you know, where would they be if they had realized that early? You know, and also the importance of it. You know, people push it off uh, to the side, including you know, sometimes uh, not so educated educators. So like, oh, yeah, that's the art class. You know. Um, so you know, hopefully. Uh, Different programs and education, and maybe a re-education. You know, people will start to understand how important, uh, you know, not just art, but even the, the three-dimensional art is to, to society. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from Can you take questions from the Zoom space or anything? Oh yeah. Are you on the Apple? Other questions? We wanted to be mindful of that um, hands on engagement of the state of the right again for people who are here. Other thoughts, reflections? I'm enjoying the whole thing. That's great. I think it's because of, I got a different. Um, attitude about academia and the community together as a combination. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of like a wake up call to me to what's next. Mm -hmm. In other words, I'm saying next time, what's next? What's next? Yeah. What's next? Yeah, um, what's next in my ceramic world? What's next? Well, I would like to say one thing is that, you know, about this, the community here, which is really, really actually really blessed with, uh, you know, having a facility like the Northern Quay Center, you know, that is so, you know, well-organized, well-endowed and, and sensitive to uh, the needs, you know, people in the community. And so, you know, those kind of places, they don't happen everywhere. They should, but, you know, I just wanted to, you know, salute, you know, uh, Northern Quay Center for putting this on and for being what, being that that oasis within the community, that creative oasis that is uh, so so sorely needed in most of our communities. So yeah, so it's a, it's an oasis within oasis within the desert. So, to speak. so thank you for being there. Yeah, and I, I I also wanted to give a shout out to Northern Clay Center, all the uh, staff for your help. Um, all the students who are attending this event. I also want to thank Jasani Dean and Donald Clark for this project. That book yeah. is absolutely beautiful. It's a work of art. No, it was not easy working with all the artists on Zoom call, remote and everything. Um, I don't know how you all did it, getting the files from everybody. But the, the book is absolutely beautiful. I think it's everyone should have a copy of it if you don't. Um, and um, I look forward to seeing the exhibition again. So thank you so much for doing that. It was yes. really needed. Thank you. Copies, copies of this book should be should be distributed to every library. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. We gotta make it a whole world. So, uh, funny to do it. And then, just when you do it, I think the best thing you can do is make sure you take a picture of it. Is that one song? So take a picture of the person and the, what they're holding and what your response is. This isn't meant to be like workshop things, but really, I'm doing it. I didn't even know I'd be doing it. I need to make something. So, I want the panel to make, everybody to make, and just document it, because we've been talking about that from panel to panel, and this is the record. Okay. So, it happens. Thank you, everybody.